It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you are all doing well. I am thankful today to have survived another election day here in the city of Madison. As most of you know, I have served as a chief inspector in the city of Madison for a number of years now. I've been an election official for probably close to 30 years or so, going back to when I came home from college for a spring break down in the Chicago area. My mom was an election official down there and I was recruited uh, drafted might be a better way of putting that. They needed some help at the last minute, and I jumped in, and I have not been able to quit over the past 30 years or so. So I did it down there in the Chicago area for a little bit, and then when we moved to Wisconsin down in Janesville, I served for about seven years as an election official down there, and as soon as we moved to Madison back in 2000, just over 20 years ago, I got plugged in with the city clerk's office immediately, and I have enjoyed being able to serve in that way. It has been an interesting experience, and I've been chief inspector down at Chavez Elementary ever since that school opened. When they opened that polling place, they were looking for a chief, and they called me, and I gladly uh, volunteered to serve in that way. Um, yesterday was obviously a big election. I led a crew of just over 90 people throughout the day yesterday, starting at 6 a.m., and we worked all the way through close to midnight. I dropped off my uh, final results and the supply tote and the empty absentee envelopes to the city county building to the clerk's office just after midnight this morning. So 12.05 a.m., I think, is when I pulled away from the city county building this morning. I noticed as I was driving away, the last TV cameraman in front of the city county building uh, put his camera away, took it off the tripod and packed it up. So I was one of the last to make it down there. Uh, Chavez is on the far southwest side of Madison. It is about as far away from the clerk's office as you can get in a polling place in Madison. So we got our stuff together. We got it done. Uh, roughly, let's see, over 5,000 votes were cast in wards 97 and 98 where I was working and probably more than 3,000 of those were absentee ballots, which was most of the work that we did yesterday. Most of our crew worked on those, and yet we got them done around 6 or 7 last night, so before the polls closed at 8. But it was an interesting experience. I got home this morning just a little bit after 12.30, if I remember correctly. So it was a long day, but a lot of good was done, and our numbers matched. All of our paperwork was good. took a few hours at the end to make sure everything was squared away, but it was and I'm thankful for the good help that we had. I'm thankful for a peaceful election here in the city of Madison. Uh, please be sure to send me any prayer request. I would appreciate that. If you're joining us on the phone and don't have internet access, you can give me a call or text me at 608-224-0274. That is the church number, and we can get calls and texts on that number. Uh, if you know my cell phone number, uh, I would love it if you would call or text that. That's great also. Somebody was act asking me that week. I just don't put the cell number out there for all of the world to see, I guess. So uh, the church number is 608-224-0274. If you do have internet access and you have something we need to be praying about or some way we can serve you, my email address, the church address is fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. So if there's anything we as a church can do to serve or to help in some way, if there's something we need to be praying about, uh, we would invite you to get in touch in that way. We'll see what we can do. Uh, please remember also that we are not meeting for in-person worship again this coming Sunday. We did not this past Lord's Day, and we are not doing in-person worship at least for another Sunday. We'll reevaluate after this. As most of you know, there's been a spike of cases here in Dane County. A number of our members have tested positive for the virus as well. Several have tested negative. Uh, after some close calls, we might say, with the virus, so we're thankful for that good news, but uh, we'll reevaluate that next week and go from there, but uh, we will not be meeting at the building uh, this coming Lord's Day morning, and we hate to do that. We want to be together. It's important to be together, but we want to be safe at the same time as well. Tonight, we're continuing in our pause in studying from the book of Luke, and we're looking at another tool that we have sometimes used in teaching the gospel to people. We know that those who believe in God, those who believe in the Bible as his word, will sometimes need help with what the Bible teaches. They'll need help understanding what the Bible teaches concerning what we need to do to be saved. And sometimes it's easy for us to think, well, the Bible's so simple. How could somebody need help understanding it? And yet, I understand the thought there, and yet at the same time, we also need to think about the Ethiopian officer in the book of Acts. Remember, 
Uh, here was this man who was returning home after having been to Jerusalem for the purpose of worship. And on his way back home to Ethiopia, he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And you may remember God arranges for Philip the evangelist to join up with this Ethiopian officer, the treasurer of the nation, uh, and he joins him in, on his chariot. And at that point, Philip comes up and he says, do you understand what you are reading? And you may remember the Ethiopian officer basically says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And at that point, Philip preaches Jesus to the man. And as they travel along, after having heard all about Jesus, the Ethiopian officer basically says, look, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? And of course, Philip responds, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the Ethiopian officer says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and he's immersed in water uh, right there by the side of the road. And so I'm paraphrasing that account. I, I hope you'll check that out and look up that account on your own and learn that for yourself if you don't know it already. But the point is, sometimes we need help in understanding the scriptures. Unfortunately, many times people in our world have had help misunderstanding the Word of God. Uh, and so we'll emphasize faith and repentance and confession and baptism, and many in the religious world will object to that. And they'll say, no, no, no. Baptism can't be necessary for salvation because baptism is a work, and we're not saved by works. Therefore, baptism has nothing to do with us being saved. Have you heard that argument? I've heard that a number of times, probably many times through the years. And what's happened there is, uh, they've combined a number of scriptures, taking them out of context and putting them all together to somehow suggest that we're saved by faith only and that there's nothing that we must actually do in order to be saved. That's a common misunderstanding in the religious world. And I know personally, I've seen this many times over and over again through the years. And many of you have probably heard or seen this as well. Well, Tonight, I want to reintroduce a study sheet that we have looked at a time or two through the years. And I'm putting it on the screen here. And the question is, what do the scriptures teach? So at the top of the sheet, there's that question, what do the scriptures teach? And then there is the invitation to check all that apply. And you'll notice down there at the bottom, we're starting with Acts 17.11. So that'll be something of our theme verse for the study we're doing. And we'll keep that on the screen as we study because Acts 17, 11 is a record of Paul coming to Berea. And Paul was teaching the word of God. He was explaining that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies. But the people in Berea were fact-checking Paul as he spoke. And I appreciate what Brother John said about this a few weeks ago when he taught on Sunday morning. But whenever Paul would say something in Berea, these people would look it up. And so they wouldn't just take his word for it. They wouldn't just trust Paul. This is Paul we're talking about. But they wouldn't just trust him. They would compare what Paul was saying with the actual word of God. So Acts 17, 11 says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That is the attitude that we need to have. Whenever we hear something in the realm of faith, whenever we hear something in the realm of religion, we need to compare it to Scripture. We need to go back and forth between what we hear and what we know to be true from the Word of God. So that's what we'll be doing tonight. We'll go through this worksheet line by line. I'll try to send this out by email. I'll try to put it in the description of this video if I can. But in the big picture, we have this blank sheet asking the question, what do the scriptures teach? And then we have a series of 14 statements. And there is an empty checkbox in front of each one of these. And again, I've used this with many people who insist that we're saved by faith only and that there's no way baptism could ever possibly be a requirement. That's what many people say. Well, the goal of this worksheet here is to show that we can't just isolate little bits and pieces of scripture here and there and think that it gives us the big picture. And so the goal then is to show that we really need to take all of what the Bible teaches on salvation. 
And when we see that one thing saves us in one passage and something else saves us in another passage, it's not a matter of choosing between the two. <laughs> if they're both in the Word of God, we don't need to choose between them, but instead we need to take everything together. And so when I go through this with people, I will give them the blank sheet, and then I'll invite them to put a check mark or an X by every statement on this page that they think is true. So notice number one, we are saved by grace. Is that or is that not a true statement? Check it if it applies. Are we saved by grace? We're saved by mercy. We're saved by words. We're saved by truth and so on down through the list. And then we'll get back together to look at some scriptures that go along with each one. And hopefully by the time we get to the end, we have a much better understanding of what we really need to do to be saved. And hopefully we also see as we go along that we can't really isolate any one of these from the others. Just because one is true doesn't take away from another one being true. So let's go through this line by line tonight. And again, sometimes I'll uh, let them have a few hours or a few days, even a couple weeks to look at this. So just check all you think that apply. When we get back together, we'll go through it. So again, not necessarily for our benefit tonight. Hopefully it helps us. Uh, but again, we're doing this so that we have this as a way of helping and teaching others. So let's start with number one. We are saved by grace. The question is, does that apply? Is this a true statement? Are we saved by grace? Well, many people in the religious world hopefully will agree that yes, we are saved by grace. I don't know very many who would object to that. Uh, the word grace refers to a gift. And so salvation is a gift. And we have two pictures that we can include here, starting with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. So out to the right of statement number one, I would write a reference. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. That's where Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So very clearly, we are saved by grace, aren't we? That is a true statement. Salvation is indeed a gift from God. We could also consider Romans 3.24. So that would be a good reference to put out beside this one. Romans 3.24, where Paul refers to being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So yeah, we're saved by grace. We're saved by the grace of God. I would also point out in both of these passages, I find this interesting, that we have not only the word grace, which comes from a word referring to a gift, but in both of these passages, notice in English, we also have the word gift, don't we? For by grace we have been saved through faith. It is the gift of God. And then being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. So we have grace and gift. And that just emphasizes that, yes, indeed, salvation uh, is a gift from God. We are saved by grace. We're saved by the grace of God. So number one. Uh, absolutely is a true statement. Let's continue looking at number two. We are saved by mercy. So is that a true statement? I believe that it is. We have several scriptures that could apply here, but I would write down, I would want us to consider Titus chapter 3 verses 5 through 7. Titus chapter 3 verses 5 through 7. This is where Paul says, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so we are saved according to God's mercy. Notice also, we have another reference to grace in this passage. So with a lot of these, we will see some overlap. And some of these verses we could obviously put in multiple categories. And there are obviously a number of other passages in the Bible that we could uh, pull out and quote here referring to God's mercy. Uh, but this one very clearly proves it, that yes, indeed, we are saved by the mercy of God. So we're saved by grace and we're saved by mercy. Let's look at the third statement here. We are saved by words. And so the question is, are we saved by words? Is this a true statement when we say that we're saved by words? Well, the first passage here is James chapter 1. 
verses 21 and 22. James 1, 21 and 22, where James says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Again, James 1, 21 and 22. So the word of God is able to save our souls. Of course, we need to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. But I think we see very clearly here that, yes, indeed, the word of God uh, does save us. The other reference comes from Acts chapter 11, verse 14. And Peter is referring to the situation with Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius was actually converted in chapter 10, but in chapter 11, uh, Peter has to defend himself to his Jewish brethren. And, and so he's explaining this to them. And I find it kind of funny that he quotes Cornelius, who is quoting the angel. So in a sense, we have a three-tier quote. Uh, Peter quoting Cornelius, quoting the angel. I find it funny myself that now, tonight, or today, I am quoting Peter. So we have a, a four-tier quote here. Baxter is quoting Peter, who quotes Cornelius, who quotes the angel, explaining that Peter will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. But the point is, Cornelius was saved by words, wasn't he? Peter would speak words to Cornelius by which he and his household would be saved. Well, we know, of course, that Peter spoke the word of God to Cornelius. Didn't just preach his opinions, but he preached the word of God. And, of course, toward the end of that study that he did with Cornelius, he commanded Cornelius and his household to be baptized. And we'll get back to that in just a little bit. But the point is here, uh, we are saved by words. We're saved by the word of God. Let's continue with number four. We are saved by truth. Is that a true statement? Is it true that we're saved by truth? Well, the first passage here that we could refer to is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, where Paul is warning against falling for Satan's lies. And this is what he says. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Well, I would point out that's the negative side, isn't it? Some people did not love the truth so as to be saved. So I would just point out here, it seems safe to logically conclude that those who did love the truth were saved. And so uh, I, I believe very safely we can say 2 Thessalonians 2.10 teaches that we are saved by truth. Uh, the other passage here is in John 8, verses 31 and 32. And Jesus is talking to the Jews who had believed in him. And he says in John 8, 31 and 32, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And although salvation is not explicitly mentioned, uh, Jesus very clearly refers to knowing the truth, and that knowledge of the truth is able to set us free. And I would take being set free uh, as being synonymous with salvation. So I, I would ultimately take that as a reference to salvation. I would also point out there uh, that being set free or being saved is contingent upon us continuing in his word. Did we catch that there at the beginning? If you continue in my word... So I think we could also add this as a reference to number three, if we wanted to. We are saved by words. If we continue in the word of Christ, uh, then uh, we will be saved. We will truly be disciples of him. Okay, let's move on to number five here. We are saved by the name of Jesus, or we're saved by the name of Christ. And the first passage is Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, Peter is preaching to the Sanhedrin. And referring to Jesus, he says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That seems pretty clear, doesn't it? We are saved by the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So yes, we are saved by the name of Jesus. The other passage is John 14, verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. 
So Jesus is the way to salvation. We are saved in his name. And I believe both of these passages would support number five being true. Let's continue then with number six. We are saved by the life of Christ. And I don't always think about this in these terms. I don't always think about us being saved by the life of Jesus. Um, I think it's fairly clear that we're saved by the death of Jesus. And as I've studied this over and over the last few weeks, preparing for tonight's lesson, uh, I've started to realize I didn't put that in this list of, what, 14 items. This could have been number 15. Maybe next time we'll add this. But we are saved by the death of Jesus. I'm sure we can find support for that in Scripture. Uh, but the question here, we are saved by the life of Christ. Is that a true statement? Well, for this, we come to Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans 5, 10. This is where Paul says this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And I find that interesting. We are saved by the life of Jesus. Again, obviously we are saved by his death or through his death or because of his death. Uh, but here we also find that we are saved by the life of Christ. Let's continue on with number seven. And the statement here, we are saved by the gospel. Is that a true statement? The gospel is the good news. Uh, the first passage here is Romans 1.16, where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, the gospel or the good news is God's power of salvation. So I would take that as a true statement. Yes, indeed, we are saved by the gospel. The gospel is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Well, there are other passages we could consider here, but I think most would agree based on this, that we are saved by the gospel. I hope you also caught in the middle there, it's conditional. Even being saved by the gospel is conditional. If you hold fast the word I preached to you, Paul says. So again, we could add this back under number three if we wanted to as well. We are saved by words. Our salvation is conditional on holding fast to the word that we've heard through the preaching of the gospel. So we are saved by the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let's continue going on to number eight. Number eight, we are saved by hope. Uh, the first passage here is Romans 8, 24 and 25, where Paul says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. So clearly we are saved by hope. Uh, we have a bit more information over in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So hope is an anchor for the soul. Hope is like an anchor that we cast in heaven and it pulls us in, so to speak. I remember studying for this passage for a sermon a number of years ago, and I remember learning something interesting that I'd never heard before, but apparently sometimes uh, boats, large ships out in the open water, would put their main anchor into something of a rowboat, I would describe it as. That rowboat would then row over into the safe harbor, drop the main anchor, and then the ship would pull itself using that main anchor. They would pull themselves into the safety of the harbor. And that seems to be the picture that the author of Hebrews is painting for us here. We cast our anchor in heaven. That's our hope. And that hope pulls us home 
as we live this life. So indeed, we are saved by hope, according to these two passages here. Let's move on to number nine. We are saved by faith or belief. I believe those two words are basically the same uh, in the Greek language. And again, this is one that most people will agree on. The first passage here is Acts 16.31. And this is where Paul is uh, speaking to the Philippian jailer. The jailer is about to take his own life because the prison nearly collapses. Everything, the gates fly open. All the prisoners are let go because of this earthquake. And he's about to commit suicide because he knows under Roman law, his life has to be taken if anybody deserving of the death penalty gets away. He takes the punishment they would have received. That's how serious it was for a jailer to do his job well. Well, in the middle of the night, this man wants to know, what do I do to be saved? And Paul, in response to that question, says, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, it's very easy to take this passage out of context, isn't it? I know I've heard people do this over and over through the years. People will point to Acts 6, 31, and they'll say, Look, right there, right there in the Word of God, it just says you need to believe in Jesus to be saved. And they'll isolate that passage. What some might not realize is the jailer at this point knows basically nothing about Jesus. And so Paul says, you need to believe in Jesus. Then Paul has to tell him about Jesus, which he does. And once he goes on and explains who Jesus is, that's when Paul continues by telling him or commanding him to be baptized. So I would suggest we need to keep on reading. And I know we've talked about this over and over and over again through the years. Whenever somebody quotes a verse and it seems to teach something bizarre, we usually just need to read a few verses before it and a few verses after it. We need to get the context. And if we do that, 99 times out of 100, that will correct the problem because we've seen that the, the verse has been yanked from context. And that's the case here. Keep reading. And, and that's where we get to the rest of the story. But for the purpose of this study, Acts 16.31 definitely teaches that faith or belief in Jesus has a place in God's plan. Then we have just a bit more information over in Hebrews 11, verse 6, coming near the beginning of an entire chapter about faith. The writer of Hebrews says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Let's continue on with number 10 here. We are saved by a confession of our belief. Are we saved by confession? So it's not just believing, but we have to actually say it. Uh, we need to speak it. This is not an undercover kind of faith. We are not secret Christians hoping nobody ever figures it out. That's not okay. We have to actually be public with it. We have to be open with it is the concept here. Uh, we see this in Romans 10 verses 8 through 10, where Paul quotes from the Old Testament. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we're preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. I've had people uh, in discussions with me, take this verse out of context, as with many of these tonight, and they'll say, look, right there, it says, if you believe, if you confess with your mouth, you're good to go. You, you're in. You're a Christian. That's all you need to do. I've heard people uh, refer to uh, the Roman road to salvation. Do you believe in the Roman road to salvation? Well, I know what they mean by that, because they're referring to to this passages and a few others like it while ignoring what the first half of Romans 6 says about salvation. So yeah, we do believe in what the book of Romans says about salvation. We don't believe that the book of Romans is all that God says about salvation. We need to combine all of it together. Uh, notice also the emphasis on the word in this passage. So this is another one we could add up to number three here. We're saved by words. Uh, but clearly here, confessing Jesus as the Lord. Uh, plays a role in our salvation. Uh, also notice the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, where Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. 
But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So this confession goes both ways. If we admit publicly to knowing Jesus down here, my understanding is, based on this passage, he will admit knowing us up there on the other side. And we want him to admit knowing us, don't we? We don't want him to be ashamed of us. And so we'd better not be ashamed of him down here as we live the Christian life. Let's move on to number 11. We are saved by repentance. Is that a true statement? We are saved by repentance. Well, we see this in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. As Paul mentions repentance and the role that it plays in salvation, he says, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So we see here that godly sorrow leads to repentance and that repentance leads to salvation. Repentance is a change of heart resulting in a change in the way that we live. And so, yes, repentance absolutely plays a role in the salvation process. Let's keep moving and notice number 12 here. We are saved by obedience. Is that a true statement? We are saved by obedience. Let's notice a couple passages here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews 5, verse 9, referring to Jesus. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Jesus wants to save everybody, but notice salvation doesn't happen for everybody. He, he becomes to those who obey him a source of salvation. So obedience plays a role in God's plan. Uh, also notice Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 15 through 18. Romans 6, 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So are we saved by obedience? Absolutely. That is a true statement. Obedience plays a role in the salvation process. Let's continue looking at the next statement up here. Number 13, we are saved by calling on the name of the Lord. Is that true? Well, we see this in Acts 2, verse 21. As Peter preaches to this huge crowd on the day of Pentecost, he quotes from the prophet Joel. And he says, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Also notice Romans 10, verse 13. We're back in Romans here. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then also, I want us to not miss how we call on the name of the Lord. And this comes in the instructions given by Ananias to Saul before his name is changed to Paul. This is Acts 22, 16. Uh, Ananias says to Saul, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. It seems then that calling on the Lord's name is something that we do in the act of baptism. By the way, remember what Saul had been doing for those three days. Sometimes people say Saul was converted on the road to Damascus. Saul did not become a Christian on the road to Damascus. His sins were not forgiven on the road to Damascus. That's where he was struck blind. And then he was told to go and continue on his journey, go to this place where he would be told what to do to be saved. He prays and he fasts for those three days. A lot of people in the religious world today would say, if you've been praying and fasting for three days, you're good to go. All you got to do is pray and receive the Lord as your Savior and all that kind of thing. That was not the case for Saul, but rather after those three days of prayer and fasting is when Ananias tells him, get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. So calling on the Lord's name is something that is required for salvation. And we see here in Acts 22:16 that that takes place 
at the point of baptism. Well, that leads us to number 14, the last one on the list here. And again, this is the one that most people have a problem with for some reason. I've had people straight up tell me, baptism will not save you. We're not saved by baptism, people will say. I remember seeing this in a Baptist church bulletin down in Janesville in a religious discussion we were having there with a, with a woman. Um, and she brought me the bulletin from her pastor. And uh, they had a list on the back of their bulletin. You know how we have the plan of salvation, what you need to do, and all that. Well, on their bulletin, they had a list of things that will not save you. Things that will not save you. And there's several things there. And I remember the second item on that list, the second bullet point, was baptism. And so according to them, baptism will not save you. Many people agree with that statement. Peter, though says something completely different from that. So we need to decide, am I going to listen to my so-called pastor? Am I going to listen to my church bulletin? Or am I going to go with Peter? I'd rather go with Peter. Let's notice uh, what Peter says. And um, in, the, in context, he's talking about the great flood and how Noah was saved through water. The water separated Noah from the wicked world. Notice what Peter says in that context in 1 Peter 3.21. He says, corresponding to that baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh but an appeal to god for a good conscience through the resurrection of jesus christ we have an interesting formatting note in the new american standard bible and in some of your other translations as well a notice in the middle in the middle we have something of a parenthetical explanation. That's about the only way I could explain it. Uh, in the New American Standard, notice that it's set off with dashes. If you notice that on the screen there, yours may have it in parentheses. It may be set off with commas or dashes. And sometimes it helps me to understand this by just taking that part out and then putting it back in. We're not harming the scriptures here. But without that statement in the middle, if we take out that parenthetical statement for just a second, Peter says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying there. Now remember, baptism is our response to the good news. It's a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So he's saying we're saved by the Lord's resurrection. So as he says here, baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a true statement. Now, the statement in the middle explains what's happening in the act of baptism. It's not a matter of scrubbing off the sins in the baptistry water. It's not a soap and a washcloth and a sponge kind of bath that we're getting. That's not it at all. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. But instead, he points out here, baptism is an appeal to God for a good conscience. Baptism is us crying out to God, making that appeal to God for a good conscience. Or as Ananias explained earlier in that previous passage we just looked at, baptism is how we call on the Lord's name. Where we put all of this together and we understand that baptism saves us, doesn't it? What Peter says here is a true statement. Baptism now saves you. Well, as we close our study, I want to put Psalm 119, verse 160 on the screen as a reminder. We studied Psalm 119 a few months ago. We had 175 verses. And out of those 175 verses, maybe all but four of those, if I remember correctly, have a reference to the Word of God. So it, it's a psalm praising the Word of God. And here we find the author saying this, praising God for his word. He says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. We know what a sum is, don't we? S-U-M, a sum. Not S-O-M-E. Not some of God's word is truth. That's not what we're saying. The sum of all of it added together is truth. So we cannot just pick and choose which parts we need to believe. We can't look at this list and say, well, I'll take number one, five, six, and nine, and that's what saves me. The other things don't. We, we can't do that. And so as God's people then, we look at what the scriptures actually teach, and we have no problem saying 
that we are saved by grace. We're saved by mercy and words and truth and the name of Jesus and the life of Christ and the gospel and hope and faith and a confession of our belief and repentance and obedience and calling on the name of the Lord and baptism. All of these things work together. We can't just pick one or two and forget about the rest, but all of these things are described in Scripture as saving us. I hope our study tonight has been helpful. If you have any questions, if there's anything that we need to add here, um, obviously, looking back on this, I, I think I should probably add we're saved by the death of Jesus and find some passages that teach that in a clear and concise way. But if you have something else that we need to add or correct, if there's something that we've overlooked, uh, please let me know. And I, I'd love to update that and improve this as we go forward. Please get in touch. And if you know somebody who tries to tell you baptism isn't necessary for salvation, well, offer them this sheet and say, well, what do you think does? Do these things save us? Put a check mark by the ones that you think save us, and then we'll go through some scriptures together. And you know, not to trick them, nothing like that, but just as a way of coming to a clearer understanding of scripture. Hopefully this will be uh, one more tool that we can use. As we close tonight, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us your word, and thank you for allowing us to study together tonight in our own language, in this format, together with our Christian friends, even though we might be far apart. We're thankful for the technology that allows us to connect in this way, and we're certainly thankful for the young men of the congregation, especially, who continue working so hard to make this possible. We're thankful for everything that you've done to save us from our sins. We're thankful for Jesus and for his sacrifice. We're thankful for your word, the Bible. We're thankful for your plan so clearly laid out for us in Scripture. We pray that we might trust and obey, for there truly is no other way to be happy in Jesus. We ask for healing tonight for those who are suffering with the virus. We're thankful for the advances that have been made over the past few months for everything that we've learned about it. We're thankful for good medical care. We're thankful for the progress that's been made on a vaccine. We ask that you would continue to bless those who work in health care. Keep them safe. Bless them with restful, peaceful sleep so they can continue doing the good work that they do. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.